Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Planning and Highways Board. I'll hand you over to Abby for the housekeeping arrangements now. Thank you, Chair. Uh, in the event of a fire alarm sounding, please take instruction from staff and stewards. The assembly point is at Tudor Square. Please can I request everyone to switch mobile devices to silent so as not to disturb the conduct of the meeting. The meeting today will be webcast and the recording will also be available for people to view later through the Council's website. While ever the meeting is open to the public, photography, video and sound recording of the proceedings is permitted. However, the Chair has discretion to withdraw or suspend this permission, for example, if the recording is disrupting the conduct of the meeting or is being undertaken in a manner which could capture personal information or in the event that a member of the public participating in a meeting objects to being recorded. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Abby. I'm just going to go around the room and ask members to introduce themselves for the benefit of people who may be watching this on the webcast. And I'll start with Councillor Price. Peter. Peter Price, member for Shea Green, Briarside. Tony. Councillor Tony Adams, councillor for Southway. Nether. Councillor Nita Bisharat uh, for Netherlands and Sharrow Ward. Thank you. Mike. Good afternoon. Councillor Mike Chaplin, also from Southey Ward. Brian? Uh, Councillor Brian Holmshaw, uh, Broomhill and Sharrow Vale Ward. I'm moving across to the other wing. I've got Cliff. I can hardly see you behind the telly, Cliff, so be sure to wave your hand if you want to speak. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm Cliff Woodcraft, um, Councillor for Fullwood. Bob? Hi, uh, <coughs> Councillor Bob McCann, uh, candidate for... Candidate. Councillor for uh, Bayton Ward. And Roger. Roger Davison, Councillor for Eccleshall. Andy. Uh, Councillor Andrew Sanger, Councillor for Forward Ward, and I'm here as a substitute member for Councillor Alan Woodcock. Barbara. Barbara Masters, Councillor for Eccleshall Ward. And last but not least, Gary. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, Councillor Gary Weather, Office Shaggy and Brightside Ward. Thank you for that. Have we any apologies today, Abby? Thank you, Chair. We've had uh, apologies from Councillor Adam Woodcock and Andrew Sangar is substituting. Thank you. Um, the next item in the agenda is exclusion of the public and press. I don't believe that we have any items today that warrant that and I'm receiving a shake of the head from, from Abby. Declarations of interest. Does any member have any declarations of interest against any item? Councillor Holmshaw. Hello. Um, yes, so uh, one of the applications is in my ward, but I have not received any uh, representations on it. Is that enough? And, uh, sorry. Sorry, Chair. Could you just tell me which application it is, Brian? on Southbourne Road. I can't see any more indications. Uh, minutes from the previous meeting, there in your pack between, between pages 9 and 14. So I'll go through them for any matters arising page by page, page 9, page 10, page 11, page 12, Councillor Chaplin. Thank you, Chair. Um, is this the right time to say that there's, um, I have been mis, <laughs> I have been named in error. Um, page 11, uh, 6B.5, um, it says that it, this was sec seconded by Councillor Mike Chaplin. That wasn't the case um, because I'd previously declared an interest in um, supporting retention of the uh, community park. It might have been one of these two colleagues in front of me, but I um, couldn't swear to it. Um, we'll check that out on the webcast and, and I'll get oh, Abby to um, file a correction note if that's the case. Thank you, Mike. Um, and finally, page 13. I can't see any indications there. So can we, with the... Um, amendment as as given. Can we uh, accept those as a pre as a true record? Agreed. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, and now site visit, members will have a Monday before the next planning meeting held in their diary for in case there are any site visits that we need to go on and officers will communicate with you in the lead up to the next meeting, where we're meeting and at what time, although the bus has now restarted way. And now we come to agenda item seven, um, applications um, under various acts and regulations. And the first application we have got is application 22-00455-FUL, which is a full planning application concerning the dem demolition of an existing dwelling house and erection of four dwelling houses with garages and associated landscaping works. And the loco location of this is at Southern Wood, 62 Dole Road. I'll hand over to Chris now. Um, for the presentation. I have to say now, um, we may have some issues for those watching by webcast about the um, viewing of the uh, officer report, have we, Claire? W will that see? Right, so um, we will be able to see it in the room, the members who are taking the decision, and we will be able to read the report and we'll be able to hear the officer report but people that are watching the webcast will see gaps with regards to the, the presentation. So I apologize for that. It's a technical error, which we couldn't overcome in time. So it's over to you, Chris. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, so we've got just the one screen and um, th this, I'll put the, the images will appear on there. This, this application is for uh, a piece of land located off Door Road. You can see there the access point coming down onto Door Road. Um, there is a property in, in front of it, um, which is number 62C. Um, and then you'll, you'll see from that image that there is a, a, a series, a pattern, a character almost of uh, individual, large individual properties with large gardens, but historically, in many cases, larger gardens uh, that have had individual properties built and, and sometimes more than one property built in, in the rear gardens. So the, the building in the center of the, of the red line is number 62, Doe Road. Uh, that building is to be demolished um, and would be replaced with four five bedroom dwellings um, identical in form, uh, running from north to south, effectively. You can see there, there are properties uh, on, on each sort of boundary of the site. Um, so the developments had to take account of, of, of impact on those in terms of uh, layout uh, and design. Um, the site, as you can see there, has been the subject of previous applications. Uh, most recently, a refused application to demolish the existing dwelling and replace with two blocks of 10 apartments, so 20 apartments in total, Chair. Um, that was refused recently for the reasons given in the report. Um, and a little bit less recently, we've had permissions for one large dwelling um, towards the top end of the site, you can see a kind of a small mound of vegetation in the top uh, portion of the site. Um, and that was the site of a, a large dwelling which spread quite a long way across from sort of east to west. Um, that was a permission from um, the 2000 and 2003 uh, and was regularly renewed most recently in 2015, um, but that has now lapsed. Um, but there is a pattern of, of approval on that part of the site that is a material consideration. Um, so there, there is quite a lot of photographs, Chair, um, but it, it's quite a large site and it's, it's viewed from um, 
lots of different kind of properties, if you like. So this is the uh, access road. Um, the image in the top left is actually looking back down the access road towards Doe Road, uh, and the image on the top right is looking up from, from Doe Road. Um, you can see the two images at the bottom, they are of uh, surrounding uh, dwellings. So the bottom left um, is number 64, Doe Road, um, and then to the, just on the right hand edge of that image on the bottom left and the, uh, the bottom right hand image is number 62A, that's the property with the small, small dormer windows in it, uh, and that's on the northern boundary. Uh, the, the, these images tend to kind of pan around the side, uh, so these are more images of number 62A predominantly. Uh, and then some of these are labelled. So the the property you can see in the top two images is number 62, um, which is close to the boundary. That does have some windows in that property, but they're either high level, um, so privacy isn't a concern, or are and overlooking of, of the actual application site isn't a concern, um, or uh, things like stair cores. Um, Number 62C is that property, and that's an image of the site taken from it at the bottom left. Uh, the, the top two and bottom left images here are taken from number 60, uh, which is a property that fronts Doe Road, um, a, a, a traditional property, and has quite a substantial garden. Uh, and the views there are taken uh, from within that garden, looking towards the site. And you can see the ridge line and, and roof, in fact, of, um, of the existing house, which is to be demolished. Um, then the bottom right-hand image um, is at number 68D, uh, and that window, the larger of those two windows, the three windows, sorry, there, is a bedroom window, which is referred to within the report. Um, where we, we make a comment on, on the distance from that to the nearest, pro nearest proposed property. Um, this, these are taken from the front garden uh, area of number 60D, which is the only garden space to that property. Uh, and you can see on that, hopefully, um, if you can pick out the sort of, on the top left hand image, just a, sort of a turreted, uh, castellated extension um, which uh, is on the far side of the site um, so that kind of demonstration you can see effectively across the site and then these images are taken from number 60C which is um, one of the uh, slightly older backland development um, plots uh, looking towards the site and 64 and 64A. Um, so there are a lot of images there that might not mean a lot uh, without being on the site, but it's helpful to have them to refer to. Uh, so this is the layout, uh, four individual plots. You can see the access road is being slightly widened, widened but within its parameters. It's not taking any additional land. Uh, there's some minor remodeling at, the, at, its, um, at the mouth of the access. Uh, the, the, carriageway, if you like, is being increased in width, um, and there is uh, a turning head or turning space, um, and which would double as a passing space, uh, just as the site widens out there. Um, we quote, I won't go through all the distances, Chair, that would take a long time, but we quote the distances, if you see the little red marks on here, they're the distances that are uh, um, are used to provide the information within the report. Um, and there are various kind of key points from proposed building to uh, existing building, etc. Uh, what you can see there is perhaps worth pointing out that the rear, the, this laser doesn't seem to, it works on the wall but not on the screen for some reason. Um, so. The property at the bottom of the page, the, the, the garden of the, that those images were, were taken from, 
um, the larger garden is the rear of the um, larger sort of almost rectangular uh, square block to the right of the uh, access road. So it's immediately to the right of the access road um, adjacent to the bottom proposed plot. And the bedroom window that I was referring to on the image um, is uh, going up from bottom to top on the right hand side is the top existing uh, dwelling on the right hand side underneath the, the text on the drawing. This shows uh, retained trees and their root protection areas. They're the pink, uh, pink areas. Uh, and these are, these are layouts of the property. You'll see the substantial properties. They've got two parking spaces, uh, substantial living areas. There are five bedrooms um, and uh, sort of additional ancillary rooms, such as TV rooms, playrooms, etc., up on, up on the top floor. Um, which is the one on the right. Uh, these are the elevations. And what, what's worth noting, because they get referenced in the report, is the, those, uh, those windows at the top. They're on the top floor where there's a TV room and a bedroom um, with uh, horizontal slats. And the purpose of those is to reduce the perception of overlooking to, um, to people on the, in properties on the eastern side. Um, they're stone built metal clad uh, properties, uh, so with metal cladded elements, should I say. Uh, the garages have flat green roofs. Um, that is a, a long section, so the, the contemporary property that's built on the door road frontage is the block on the immediate left, uh, on the, sorry, on the far left. Uh, you can see the site is relatively level, it, it slopes, it's got a slight crown in the middle, um, slopes towards the right hand end of that image somewhat. And then the, one of the earlier images that I showed you with the, uh, with the bungalow with the uh, Doma windows is the, is the smaller property on the right. Uh, so you can see the sort of relationship in height terms there. And also what's worth noting is in the, the, the property that has a kind of a turret, uh, sort of castellated top, is the red line uh, which protrudes some distance above the two right-hand properties, to give you an idea of scale. There's approximately, a, I think it's a four metre uh, difference in, yes, pretty much bang on four metres difference in height between the top of those castellations and, uh, and the ridge height of these properties. Uh, that is a cross-section chair showing you in the, the top portion how the, the slats would work to, to limit outlook and remove a perception of overlooking. Um, and they are some 3D uh, images. That's largely it, Chair, in terms of introduction, apart from... Um, drawing members' attention to the supplementary agenda. So the, the first, in fact, one, the only item on the supplementary agenda relates to this. Uh, the first amendment is a amendment to condition two, uh, which is to replace one of the drawings listed uh, with a drawing that now has ridge heights plotted on it, um, and to include a topographical survey it wasn't critical to the assessment at the time, Chair, but it's useful to have as a, as a record. Um, and then there are two conditions which can be removed. Um, condition seven related to works uh, to be carried out, intrusive investigations to do with the potential for uh, past uh, shallow coal mining activity. Um, but we've now had, and thir condition 13 required a, a signed declaration to confirm that the site was stable for development following those site investigations. But an investigation has now been undertaken, Chair, um, and has been assessed by the Coal Authority, who have confirmed that they're happy um, with the contents of the report, and that advises that the investigations didn't encounter any coal seams. So uh, 
a, a no broken ground or voice were recorded. So therefore, condition 17 can now be removed um, with any further consideration on, on matters such as that forming part of the building regulations application. Okay, thank you very much for that, Chris. We have speakers on this application, um, and the first one that's listed is Mr. Alan Disney. Mr. Disney, if you'd like to come forward to, um, Claire will show you which console it is and how to, to use the console. Mr. Disney, the floor is yours. You have up to five minutes. The floor is yours, Mr. Disney. You have up to five minutes. Good afternoon. Um, all of my neighbours accept that houses should be built on this site, but those houses must take account of the privacy and amenity value of the existing residents. Our comments relate generally to the three dwellings on the lower lying eastern land, the gardens of which run the full extent of the site. I live in one of those houses. The National Planning Policy Framework and Sheffield Unitary Development Planning Policy state that development should have a high standard of amenity for existing users and should not cause harm to the amenities of existing residents. The report mentions that there are no significant adverse impacts on neighboring properties, but my neighbors disagree. The three-story houses would be built on higher ground and they are extremely close to existing ones. This causes overbearing and overlooking. They look into our gardens from the large east-facing windows. For planning applications to be validated, certain documents are required. One that is necessary is a plan relating to sloping land showing cross sections between properties so that the vertical characteristics can be considered. No such plan was submitted and the planning officer was advised accordingly. There has been a deliberate avoidance in supplying these cross sections as it would be detrimental to the application. So how can a recommendation be made? Sheffield supplementary planning guidance suggests 21 meters separation between facing properties with possible additions for differences in land height, although this need not necessarily be followed by the planners. Most of the local authorities are more specific. Generally, either two meters or three meters should be added to the distance for each additional story, together with a doubling of the difference in land height. In the case of the bungalow at 60C, that could be as much as 31 meters from its facing lounge window, not 20 meters as now envisaged. In this application, the officer has not allowed any additions, only subtractions. Because of the high height difference, separation in this application is unreasonable. Bearing in mind that the new three-story houses built on higher land will tower above those on the eastern side. My own dormer bungalow had a condition imposed in that all of the rear windows had to be installed with obscure glazing to avoid overlooking the adjoining garden. In the Redlands planning application, located a few doors lower down door road, two applications for houses were rejected in 2020 and 2021 because one new house was to be positioned nearly 30 meters away from an existing one. That was considered insufficient to allow privacy and overlooking, although they were on level land and both two-story dwellings. On appeal, it was allowed, but the new house now has no windows in the facing elevation. If unfortunately you are minded to approve this planning application, it is imperative that conditions are laid down to ensure that overlooking cannot occur and that the first and second floors of each house should have conditions imposed 
to fix obscure glazing in the facing windows. Finally, the application mentions exemption from the community infrastructure levy as the houses are to be self-built. The self-build regulations allow for homeowners to apply for an exemption, but to be able to do that, the authorities have to be certain that the homeowners have made a direct input into the house's final design and layout. First owners must live there for three years. Each of the four homes are identical. No individual owner has had any input to the submitted plans. So there seems to be an attempt to avoid the community infrastructure levy and there is the further likelihood that if self-built houses are really to be built, it will be necessary for four more individual planning applications to be submitted. In the light of this, if self-built houses are to be the future plan, then the present application ought not to be considered for approval. For these reasons, this application should be rejected. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Disney. Um, I now have Councillor Colin Ross who um, wants to make a, a representation. Uh, <coughs> thank you, thank you, Chair. Well, well, actually, this has this covered uh, a, a lot of the ground. Um, as I said in, in my submission, that I'm not against housing on this site. In fact, it is suitable for housing but this particular application is not quite there. And it's a pity that in pre-planning advice, we couldn't have had some modifications to this, which would have made it acceptable. And the main grounds for that are um, the overlooking of the properties on the east. Those of you who went on the site visit will know that um, it's the elevation of the ground which ex exacerbates the problem. So they, they uh, above the, the lower properties of Dormer bungalows and the one large house on the, on the east side of, of the property. I believe the problem could have been overcome if um, a condition had been agreed to put obscured glazing uh, in level uh, on the first floor and the second floor level, which would have mitigated the, the overbearing nature of it. And I don't know whether that can be agreed at, at this, this late stage. The sight lines and distances are also, as Mr. Disney has pointed out, very close to being um, against our guidelines and very marginal in the acceptance. And, and, and again, it would have been preferable if there had been slightly stepped back of these, these new properties because there isn't the same issues at the rear of the properties that there is at the, the front of the properties. As a side issue, there's one of the, the properties has solar panels and I think these will be largely one of the existing properties as solar panels and um, the, new, the new builds will, will inhibit the efficiency of the, those solar panels. I also want to refer to the, the sill um, the conditions. It seems to me that this is a slightly disingenuous uh, method, although probably legal as I've made inquiries, to avoid the SIL uh, payment, which obviously mitigates for the local community some of the, the effects of that. And as Mr. Disney has pointed out, that if they are to be self-filled, each individual should have an input into the, the design and therefore would have to submit another application. Um, so actually in response to the questions, I'd like um, Chris, if you could clarify the position on, of SIL and the legality and what happens if, in, if they are to be self-built, um, the consequences for planning applications, and if all four properties are to be built by the same builder, would that mean that they become liable for SIL? And my final point is, you will note in the report as well, that the um, Door Neighbourhood Forum, because this has got a neighbourhood plan, has, has made objections to the proposals on the same lines as the two of us have outlined as well. And the fact that it's got a neighbourhood plan is perhaps significant in this case as well. Thank you for your forbearance. Thank you, Councillor Ross. I guess your request of Chris was through the chair. 
and I will go back to... Um, Grovelling apologies, uh, Chair. <laughs> And I would go back to Chris now to ask if you have any comments on the representations thus made. Sorry, Chair, I was pressing the wrong gadget. Um, yes, so I think there are, there are kind of uh, two main concerns there set out uh, from Mr. Disney in terms of uh, the, well, from both Mr. Disney and Councillor Ross around uh, living conditions, particularly to the properties on the east. Um, with overlook largely through overlooking uh, from those upper floor windows um, and, and the sill aspect. I'll attempt to answer the sill question, Chair, first, um, because this, this was a question that arose when, when we received the application. Um, so, I mean, there are all sorts of potential permutations with this, and it could be a very long winded answer, but the, the rules that allow for uh, exemption through self-build uh, that's part of the regulations um, the key thing is that before commencing work uh, the developer has to um, assume liability for for the the payment or as it can turn out non-payment uh, of silk through the process before they commence on site um, so it's a legal requirement that they do that um, and it could be that you know, one is self self built and, and the others aren't. Um, it, it's not relevant to the decision on the planning application and the merits of the scheme. Um, but uh, one could pay. Uh, uh, the, sorry, they could be self built for one, and the others could not be self built, and they would all re be required to pay sill uh, or any other combination between kind of one and four uh, of that. Um, or for if if they were being built out. Uh, for um, for self build, um, four people could assume liability uh, and apply for self build relief before commencing on site. Uh, so they're all sorts of potential. I can't second guess chair what's likely to happen, uh, but the regulations do allow for uh, sill relief um, exemption for for self build properties. And yes, there are rules around uh, how long people must um, live within that property before it's then later sold on. Um, in terms of just to answer a question, as I say, it's not really relevant to the determination of whether this application is acceptable, but in terms of answering a question that might emerge, uh, if further down the line, if, if permission was granted today and they were to be self-filled, or indeed if they weren't, and there was a, a desire to change uh, anything to do with the, the scheme as permitted, any of the approved drawings, in other words, then yes, that would require um, a separate application. Uh, so it's possible that there could be further applications further down the line, but that's the case with, with every uh, planning decision that, that we make. Um, there are often amendments once uh, things get close to being built on site or even as things are progressing. Um, in terms of the overlooking uh, impacts, I'll try and help with uh, with the images to try and demonstrate this. So just to go back to probably that plan. Um, the properties to the, the, the plan is, is, is pretty much uh, north at the top. So um, it's those properties on the right hand side that are being referred to when we talk about to the east. Um, so we have number 60 at the bottom, number 62, sorry, number 68C in the middle and number 60D at the top. Um, the, the areas of concern that Mr. Disney was referring to in terms of his own property are in relation to number 60D at the top. And if you can see there, there's a, each property has a slightly um, deeper, lower portion than a uh, in, in footprint terms, a slightly deeper lower portion than, than the top portion. And if I go to the, no, the wrong way. If I go to the uh, images, this plan probably is, is as good as any. So um, that shows the, the floor layout uh, with the properties that we're concerned about in terms of overlooking would be to the bottom of this. So 
uh, there are bedrooms. Uh, on the left-hand image, there's a bedroom and a study um, with a window uh, sort of with an unfettered view uh, out uh, in that direction. And then on the right-hand side, uh, that's intended to be a, a TV room um, and uh, a bedroom. Sorry, it's a bedroom, a bedroom and a study, I think, on the first floor. That's correct. And a, and a, and a TV room and a bedroom on the second floor. And they're the windows where the, the slats are incorp incorporated to try and minimise that sort of perception of overlooking um, and to limit the ability to view directly out of them. The distances that we, and, and yes, they are, I'll give you, try and give you some idea of height, because height was mentioned. Um, so the ridge height is the most information I've got relates to ridge heights, to try and give you an impression of, uh, of how tall the relative buildings are. Um, so Mr. Disney's property at number 60D has a ridge height, sorry Chair, has a ridge height, that's the top right hand one, has a ridge height of 167.9 metres. Um, the proposed dwelling immediately to the west of that, within the site, has a ridge height of 172.4 uh, metres. So there's a difference there of four and a half metres in terms of ridge height. Uh, so that will give you a feeling of... Um, Of, of the relevant uh, height uh, if you were stood, for instance, in Mr. Disney's uh, garden looking back at that. Then the next property down has a ridge height of, uh, of 172.8 metres and number 60C on the right-hand side has a ridge height of 166.3. Sorry, just to point out, these aren't heights above ground level. These are uh, heights above ordinance datum that have been surveyed. So they're the surveyed height. Yeah, that's not the height of the building. I'm, I just want to make that clear. That's not the height. Of, that's not the height of the building, chair. That's uh, so the, the the ground level, for instance, is at 162 meters. So apologies if that wasn't clear. So the, the buildings themselves are in the order of 10 meters high. Uh, and what I'm trying to do is give you a uh, I don't have exact heights of the floor to ceiling heights and ground to um, ridge heights of the properties, existing properties on Door Road, but I do have their surveyed ridge heights um, relative, relative to a datum point. So there's a difference in ridge heights from the proposed dwellings to the properties on the east of between uh, four and a half and five and a half metres for those two properties to the north. Uh, and that will mean that the roof space is elevated. Uh, and the, the rooms with the slatted windows are in effect in the roof, space, roof space. Yes, they are a third floor of accommodation, but they're in effect in the roof space. So within the report, we talk about some of the distances involved. And um, you'll be familiar with our guidelines. Um, which, when we're talking about facing windows, yes, Mr. Disney's correct, our, our supplementary planning guidance talks about 21 metres in a, uh, with a kind of a level playing field, and then we do look at um, increases in that from time to time where, where the topography or other circumstances um, dictate that. Um, and then also our supplementary planning guidance distance for a recommended distance for a window to a boundary is 10 metres. So if I start with a window to the boundary, in all the cases of, of those properties, they all exceed 10 metres from, um, from the, the, the wall, the east-facing wall, uh, to the boundary. And then we also need to recall that although the trees aren't in leaf all the year round, there is quite a good vegetation along that boundary. Um, I've probably not got the best of images from this time of the year. Um, 
it doesn't look like I have actually. I'm sorry about that, Chair. But those members that went on the site visit will recognise that there's a reasonable amount of tree cover in, in places. Um, that's the view from the citizens' property, so there there's just the hedge. Um, so the, the more than the, the more than achieve the, the, the 10 metre uh, separation. Um, the one area where there is a shortfall in the 21 metre window to window distance is to Mr. Disney's property. Um, and there would be an element of overlooking from that. Our view on that chair is, uh, is set out within the report on page 39. Um, towards the bottom of page 39. And, and that essentially is that the window that's in position there, we accept it, it is there, it serves a habitable room. Um, it's one of four bedrooms within the, within the property. Uh, it's not the only kind of place where, where someone can, is someone's sort of main living accommodation, in other words. Um, and it's very close to the boundary, which, in our view, is unreasonably reliant on that on that boundary for its uh, for its light and it and its outlook. Um, and for those reasons, and with the limitations that have been put on the higher level windows, um, we felt that on balance, given that this uh, the scheme is is overall a good quality scheme that's delivering. Uh, four units of, of housing, um, we felt that that of itself wasn't a, a sufficient reason to resist permission. Um, in terms of the question that was asked about obscure glazing, we haven't recommended that for those particular windows. Um, and I think all I would say to that, Chair, is if, we, if we're in a situation where we're dealing with properties where there would be bedrooms that have no outlook, we, we tend not to regard that as as acceptable. So we don't, in most cases, recommend obscure glazing of, of bedroom windows or, or habitable room windows because we feel that an outlook is important. Um, I have to say that is usually in cases where there are a fewer bedrooms and fewer rooms and people are more reliant on them. These properties have got more, more flexibility within them. Um, but uh, it was our view that it wasn't right to obscure glaze those windows and, and limit outlook, given that it was a reasonable distance um, and that we felt that that window was unreasonably reliant on the, on the, on the neighbouring lamp. Um, I think that deals with the points that were made, Chair, and I can answer anything else in questions. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, I'll open it up to members' questions. Councillor Masters. Thank you, Chair. I mean, yesterday you made clear, Chris, that sort of uh, we've got to judge this on the merits of the plans in place of us. But it seems that if only that top um, dwelling could be set back even a metre into the land, it would overcome some of the objections. Is it possible to do something like make recommendations if these plans are approved? That sort of um, that that could be done, so they not all the frontages are in one line on that new driveway, or is it something that would be subjected to another planning application, assuming that whoever brought that plot wants to go ahead with the design as it is? Thank you, Barbara. Chris, uh, Chair, I think I think my answer to that would be that if if members felt that what's proposed is not acceptable, then the right thing to do would be to uh, refuse plan permission and with an indication that something uh, that was less harmful in that particular area um, might be received more favorably. But um, we, we, we can't negotiate that change in, in, in the committee meeting chair. Thank you. Uh, Gary, Councillor Weatherall. Well, Chris, that's disappointing because that's uh, one of the things I was going to go. I mean, it's a shame we can't discuss it. I mean, is the developer here today? But if you're saying we can't do it, we can't do it. But I would have thought if the developer here, we could have a chat and 
where you could have a chat with him and, and see if that were possible. And the thing is, what I don't like is first time I've heard the, the slats to the windows. Um, you know, we want you know the glazing windows want doing whatever we say is policy. And if policy is 21 meters from window to window, you know, and on judgment, the planning officer is saying that he's happy with it because we've got these slats in. Well, I'm not happy with it because that's breaking policy. And also uh, the sill monies uh, desperately need in this city for community groups and, and whatever we use sill for. Uh, so I'm a bit, a bit disappointed. Hopefully that all built, uh, the whole floor will actually build it uh, and then we'll get some money. But uh, if you can just answer the first one with Barbara and just put a bit more emphasis on that, thanks. Uh, Chair, one thing that occurs to me is if, if we make any change, if, if, if even if we were able to discuss changes uh, within this kind of forum, then they potentially have an impact on other people who haven't got the opportunity to comment. So for, for sake of argument, if the top plot was to be moved back four or five metres, then we would have to re-notify, uh, or any distance, we would have to re-notify the, the properties to the north and to the west. Um, so we're not able to do that here. It, it, would, it would make a decision that, in my view, would, um, would sort of remove their ability to, to comment on that. Thank you, Chris. I've got Councillor Humshaw, Brian. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, Mr. Mr. Disney uh, mentions about the cross sections on slopes and where are the, where are the plans for those that I mean, we haven't had an answer on that. Uh, because even though I visited the site, it's extremely difficult without those cross sections look, being able to visualize looking down or looking up um, how high they are above the existing houses. I, and I find that very difficult to make a decision based on that. Second question is in connection with this self-build. So I can understand that viability is needed before the build starts. I think that's built in. Um, which will then mean perhaps separate applications down the line. So the difficulty for me is that, uh, is this going to be the design that I'm voting on, or is it not? Uh, because I'm, I'm meant to vote on this design now, but it might move to something else. Chris. Okay, uh, to answer the question, there are no cross sections. Um, the information that we've used to determine it uh, in that regard is our own visits to the site and the, the knowledge of the differences in the, in the relative heights of the buildings. But there, to answer the question, no, there is no cross-section to, to demonstrate that like there is with the, um, the long section. Uh, there, so, so we, that, that was the section that we have. We don't have one going the other way to uh, the opposite direction to, to neighbouring properties. Um, uh, yeah, the self-build the self uh, exemption, as I said, it, it, it's allowed for within, within the regulations. Uh, it's to encourage, it's the government's way of encouraging self-build, um, and that, that, that's what it is. Um, in terms of which scheme are you voting on, which design are you voting on, then it's the one that's in front of your chair. There, there is no other uh, proposal on the table and, uh, and in front of us. And as I said earlier, if, if there were to be changes later on, they would need to be subject to further applications. Okay, thank you, Chris. Sorry, Vicky, what's coming at this point? Thank you, Chair. Um, I noted there that there was a comment about finding the, the decision difficult with the absence of this documentation. Uh, obviously, it is open to members to um, seek a, a proposal to defer to ask the planning officer to obtain that information uh, if members feel they're unable to make a decision without it. Um, so that is something that is open to, to members to consider. Um, in terms of the SIL, just want to reiterate that obviously there's lots of different exemptions that are available for people to apply for um, once they've got permission. So in terms of whether self-build exemption comes forward or, or not, is it really relevant today in terms of um, making this decision? Thank you. Thank you for that, Vicky. I've got Councillor Bashrat Nigger. Do you want to? Yeah. I think probably uh, answered my um, 
that question. One of the one of the things um, I think I picked up was um, the over uh, ensuring overlooking is not there. Um, I think that is uh, important in terms of, especially when uh, people who are already living there are feeling uh, it's something that uh, is concerning. And uh, even though um, you've mentioned, you know, it's a good quality scheme, I can understand that. But I just wanted to point out that it's uh, making sure uh, the residents who have uh, been living there for a while, so nothing is actually impacting on them. Who, uh, from my own experience, I do, uh, I have seen and uh, heard people and actually witnessed the knock-on effect it can have on on them. Um, and not just seeing it that just that one uh, is not sufficient to refer or just you know um, ignoring that but just uh, taking that on board that it can have a knock-on effect on them. Thank you Councillor. Chris do you want to come in on that? Uh, I, I, well, I don't think there's a specific question in there but in, in, in terms of uh, just to reaffirm that we have taken account of what uh, has been said and and we've we've looked at the comments and and analyzed the comments that have been made by the local residents and and it's understandable that uh that those comments are made because as you can see from the images at the moment the 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 views from their properties and into their properties are very well into the properties are very limited at the moment uh or, or zero um and uh the, the view is currently that they have from their property and, and their main aspect is across uh, the tops of vegetation and, and sort of uh, and sky effectively um, and and there's a it's inevitable that when the development is placed in a location like that there will be some impact on neighbors chair um, and our role is to uh, is to prevent that which is uh, considered too harmful uh, and has a substantial effect on, on their amenity. Um, I think what I'm trying to say is there will always be some impact in a development like this where uh, there is currently uh, very little on the site. Um, but that's not that we don't appreciate what, members, uh, what, um, what the local community is saying about it. Uh, we, we have to try and judge whether it's, it's kind of gone too far in terms of its impact and in this case for the reasons we've said we don't we don't feel it has thank you chris i've got um mike indicating councillor chaplin thank you chair um I, I went on the site visit yesterday um and i can see that over a period of um decades um, there's been a lot of infill housing um, as landowners have given up parts of their gardens so that more houses can be put in. Um, and you, you can see that adjacent, this, this development. Um, but I think the problem I am now realising is that this development is facing, the, it's putting the front of the houses so that they're facing east whereas nearly all the other houses round about on that side of the road and going back, they're facing south. Um, and I, I can see that uh, it's, um, I, I can see why those who are living at 60D, 60C and number 60 are feeling aggrieved because they basically got the, the fronts of the houses of this new, of this proposed development. Um, looking directly into their gardens. Um, having said that, um, a lot of us live on roads where you do see a cross into the front gardens of the, of the houses opposite. Um, so I think a lot of us are trying to, to find a way forward here to, to understand um, what is a reasonable expectation, um, given that the orientation of the houses is a, a, of these of the proposed development is at 90 degrees to the way the rest of the houses are on that side of the road. Thank you, uh, Mike. Chris, do you, do you want to make a comment on that? 
Um, I don't think I can add much more to that, Chair, because uh, mm -hmm. that, in a sense, that is the issue. It's the orientation. Uh, I think Councillor Chaplin's right. Most of the, the others tend to have been uh, more of a north 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 south orientation, maybe with the exception of 60C. Um, and yes, that's where the main main tension, if for want of a better phrase, uh, arises um, with the the views to the east from the proposed properties. I can't, oh, Councillor Hunter, I'll let you have a second bite of the cherry. Thank you. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking at the density levels for, for this, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure why the, why the density of the housing is so very low. I mean, it's not something that's often argued, but the, re the report says there is a suggested requirement of 50 square metres within the SPG, Supplementary Planning Guidance, I'm assuming, and 60 square metres within the South Yorkshire Residential Design Guide. And then it goes on to say that Plot 3 has the smallest garden area, measuring 265 square metres, which is a fair size. And then Plot 4 having the largest garden at 500 square metres, which is enormous. Uh, now, it's all very nice, but it isn't really very good for Sheffield. I don't think this is a very efficient use of land. I think you're actually what you could get is a much more efficient use of land by densifying very slightly, so you densify, but also you can reduce the height. Because one of the problems that people are saying in the area is that it's, t it's too high. So you get the, both, the best of the both worlds and a balance is struck there. So I don't think it's very good for a city to have such low density in this area. Was, was there a question in there, Councillor? Uh, would, uh, so the question was at the beginning, which was why the density of housing so low? Thank you. Chris, would you like to comment? It's not a question you get asked very often. Uh, no, Chair, but it's, a, it, it's a, another common tension, I'm, I'm afraid, between uh, we, we are encouraged, required by the MPPF to maximise uh, density um, where appropriate um, to, to make efficient use of land. But at the same time, um, we're required to ensure developments uh, fit in, for want of a better expression, in terms of uh, character. And that often means uh, that the density can be driven down. Um, in this case, as, as I said, we had a, if you remember the background to this application in some respects, is the uh, previous refusal of a scheme for uh, 20 apartments, um, which would have clearly given a much higher density. Um, but we felt that particular version was, was, was out of character. Um, I'm not saying that you couldn't get a slightly higher density scheme, uh, that, that would still uh, be considered appropriate, uh, but that's why we've ended up with a uh, a, a less dense scheme um, in order to better reflect the character of, of the area of this portion of, uh, of Door Road. Thank you for that. I've got one final question from Councillor Davison. Roger. Uh, thank you, Chair. In fact, this is an addition of three houses because one is being demolished. So it is, a, yeah, um, a, a low density. Yeah. One of the questions you didn't answer, um, and it's probably not to do with planning, but was the um, uh, effect on the solar power um, of the uh, of one of the houses um, nearby. Could you um, uh, tell us if that is a problem, or um, or is it? Is, is it a problem in planning, or, or is, uh, or, or is the uh, the mathematics of that okay? Uh, Chair, I don't know the math the mathematics of it, but uh, it's capable of being a planning consideration. I've I've seen recently in the uh, in the planning press uh, commentary on cases where uh, permission has been rejected in terms of the. Uh, relating to the impact it has on a neighbouring uh, solar panel array. 
but the ones, the very few cases I have seen of that nature are in much, much tighter uh, situations than this, talking about dense terraced street locations. Uh, my view on this particular case is that there's significant separation distance between um, these properties, regardless of height, um, and the neighbouring properties for that, for that not to be a problem. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Roger. Okay, thank you, uh, Chair. If this uh, were to be passed, um, there could be a problem with siting on the road. Now, I'll direct this to, to Mark Simmons. Um, what is the possibility of having yellow lines uh, in the immediate vicinity to stop cars uh, obscuring the sight lines? Through the Chair, thank you. Roger, uh, Mark? Um, through, Would you through, like to comment? Yeah, through the chair. Um, I don't, there are lots of drives and accesses off of Door Road, very similar to this, which haven't got double yellow lines or, or parking restrictions. Um, but, but I think people generally don't park right on top of drives. I mean, it's not uncommon for the cars to emerge into the, uh, the carriageway from a private drive. Having, having, having to to observe the fact that there's, there's parking on the street and, and edge out safely um, once you've once you've seen, seen past the uh, the obstruction. And I, th I think a, a small section of double yellow lines in, in this location um, it seems seems unnecessary. Uh, in all honesty, it is very slightly on the outside. I mean, it's a very slight bend, but it's it's on the outside of. Um, a slight bend, the, the access is established. Um, um, and I think that people are used to cars emerging into the, the, the door road from private drives as they, as they drive along door roads. So my, my recommendation would be not to go for two wheel lines. Thank you, Mark. Obviously, uh, no, uh, <laughs> obviously well, I was Roger, thinking... Roger, I will indulge you. Thank you very much, Chair. It's very kind of you. Um, what I was thinking of was that um, uh, if people have um, uh, socials, there's going to be parking uh, there because they can't really park down, uh, well, there may be room down the drives, but not for many cars um, down that path. So there, there would be parking on, on the road. And there is that slight bend. Um, and cars can come down there uh, at some speed. So I, th that's why I put that uh, that case, I'll leave it there anyway. But the um, uh, the other thing was uh, that was brought up was that of the um, in, in the report about wildlife. Has that been um, looked at, and um, is that satisfactorily um, okay? Chris, is there any wildlife report? Uh, yes, Chair. The, we weren't initially satisfied with the assessment of ecological value on the site. Um, so we requested further work as part of that, which was undertaken. It's covered um, on page 45 um, of the report. Um, the, the main assessment was undertaken for bats within the existing building, um, and it was identified as a as a property that could potentially host roosting bats, but none were identified uh, at the time of the survey. Um, so in common with other uh, schemes, there's care needed to be taken there when it comes to timing of demolition, etc. cetera. Um, and similarly, there was, uh, there was evidence of, of badgers and foxes using the site, but no, um, no SEPs or, or DENs uh, present, um, and, uh, and, and also that the site had reptile potential, but again, none identified. So we've recommended a condition chair, um, which requires an ecological management plan that we would anticipate would include uh, the potential for further surveys, depending on timing and, and explanation of, of uh, timing of works and how that's going to take them to avoid damage. Uh, I was looking for that while I was
was talking and couldn't find it yet, sorry. No, neither can I, Chris. I've been looking through. Um, I remember seeing one, but it's, I can't find uh, it. Sorry, Chair, it's, uh, it's condition nine. Uh, it's, it's an ecological management plan, uh, which is about how the site would be developed, but also um, that will involve method statements around timing of works. Okay, thank you very much for that. One f very, very final question uh, from Brian, Councillor Holmshaw, then I'm moving on to comments, yeah, and I've yeah. got Councillor Price already indicated. This, this can double up as a comment or a question, uh, and it's based on what Councillor Davidson has said previously about Door Road. So, Tropping Up Door Road, uh, it's going to be extremely difficult if there are large lorries parked on Door Road. Can we make a condition, I may have missed it, it may already be in there, that the uh, construction traffic can be inside the site and not parking up on Door Road, because that will cause uh, a site hazard on the roads. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced of that. Can we do that? Thank you, Councillor. Chris, Mark? Chair, it's, it's condition number six is already in there, a highway management plan for the construction. And that is specific, I haven't seen it, I'm sorry I missed that one. Uh, that is specifically to avoid the parking on the road. Okay, thank you. Thank you, I'm moving on to comments now, and I've got Councillor Price, Pete. Thank you, Chair. The last application that came in for a, for two, three storey blocks of apartments, 20 apartments, and we quite rightly rejected that. Um, it was way over the top. But I think this is a massive, massive improvement. It's for attractive homes, and I think for the life of me, I, I, I couldn't see if we rejected this. I can't see any planning grounds for us turning that, this down, which would survive a government inspector, that's all. I think it's... Uh, the argument of a 20 metres at 60 foot, I think that's not bad. I understand the, the row over the little bits, but I just think it's a, it, it, it'd be quite a, a pleasant dwellings, and I can find no reason at all for opposing this chair, and I'm going to re support the officer recommendation. Thank you, Councillor. I've got uh, Cliff, Councillor Woodcraft. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, yeah. I think my only concern is, is the overlooking. I think, I think the rest of it is a, is a, is a good scheme. Um, it would have been really helpful to have had um, some drawings which would sort of specifically spell out what the sight lines were going to be on this site. That would have made the decision um, easier. Um, but I'm leaning in favour of, of, of uh, letting this go ahead. Thank you, Cliff. I've got Barbara, Councillor Masters. Thank, Thank you, Chair. I mean, we're being asked to vote on whether four large properties are suitable for the site, and I agree they are. And I've seen the door neighbourhood plan, and I know there's a preference for smaller buildings for downsizing, but I think actually sort of in, the, in that part, plot, four would be acceptable. My huge issue is the design. And... If they, they're all the same, the expectation is that somebody will come along and change it, but we are voting for um, buildings with a large footprint, all of the same height, and no one's going to change that. And I, I have an issue with that, especially with the overlooking for the top property. So I'm, I honestly haven't quite made up my mind yet. I'd like somebody to, to convince me one way or the other. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I've also got Councillor Chaplin. Mike, you wanted to come in? Thank you, Chair. Um, I think on balance, I'm, I'm coming round to the officer recommendation on this. Um, it, it puts in a number of new dwellings which fill quite a large space that has been... Um, most of it has been neglected for many years, and that's clearly true of the uh, of the house that um, is due to be demolished on that site. Um, the houses are set set back from the from the driveway, and they ha and they have they will have gardens, um, and I'm sure there are things that they probably won't want to see into, and will probably take measures to screen 
off from their neighbours as the neighbours themselves are perfectly entitled to do as well. And, and that goes on all across the country. People put up screens, fences, hedges, bushes. Um, and, and these are not cheek by jowl with the neighbouring properties. Um, and, they, and they're each set in their own quite reasonably reasonable um, piece of land. Um, I don't have any issues with design because we have to move with um, modern designs um, that will be sustainable. Um, so I am going to support this recommendation. I would like the sill money for the benefit of the city and the residents, um, but I don't think we can refuse it on those grounds. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mike. And I've got a comment from Council Level, Gary. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, got a few concerns, but overall, uh, I'm going to go with Officer's recommendation, Chair. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's good, a good development. You know, in Sheffield, we've got bungalows, we've got flats, right, a, right, a you know, mixture of, of lots of things, big gardens, small gardens. This is going to fit in lovely here, Chair, so I should be uh, supporting it. Thanks. Thank you, Gary. And final comment from Councillor Davison. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's, um, it's a development that you can't actually see from the road, so it's, um, it's not harming any uh, view from that point of view. The, uh, there is a, a building that is in the front of this, um, where, where this development is taking place, which is, which is fairly modern, so uh, there has been a precedent. As we say, it's, it is low density. Um, the, the quality... Uh, certainly looks um, looks looks good. I'll, obviously, there is a problem, maybe with um, one one of the houses uh, overlooking a property uh, at the bottom, and uh, I'm afraid we can't do much about that, as was stated earlier. But um, uh, I, I would um, uh, like hope that the people that take the, on these houses make sure that they don't fit artificial grasses there so that they will live with the wildlife that does exist because we all have foxes wandering in and out of our um, gardens and some of us also have budgers. So if we can live in harmony with nature, then that's, that's fine. So I just hope that uh, all, uh, all surfaces will remain permeable and that's my comment. Thank you, Councillor. I have one very, very final comment from Councillor Hampshire. Right, thank you. Um, so two, two big concerns that I have are to do with the what's referred to in the report. It actually comes directly from the report. It says, there will inevitably be some element of shadowing to occupiers of 62A, owing to the orientation of Plot 1. And I think it would have reassured me more if we'd had some more uh, 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 slope, the slope plans that we can see up. Secondly, uh, it's, well, I mean, that, that's, that's the main one. I think, I think the density is the other aspect that I'm, I'm concerned about. So again, directly from the report, is uh, the four proposed units will give a density of approximately 10 dwellings per hectare. This figure is significantly below the suggested range in Sheffield uh, core strategy 26. So there are two really key things there and I won't be voting for the officer's recommendation on those basis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, now, for the reasons as set out in the report, I am intended to go around the room and looking for your vote in respect of the officer recommendation, which is to grant conditionally. So I'm going to start out with Councillor Homeshaw. Brian. Uh, I won't be voting for the officer's recommendation in this case. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Chaplin, Mike? For the offer, officer recommendation, Chair. Councillor Bashrat. Um, I'll be wo voting for, even though uh, overlooking was uh, a concern. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dams, Tony? For the officer recommendation, Chair. Councillor Price? So I'll put the recommendation, Chair. Uh, moving on to Councillor Woodcroft, I do know that 
Admiral's still there? Yep, I'm still here. Um, for, for the uh, recommendation, Chief Chair. Thank you, Cliff. Um, Councillor McCann, Bob? For the recommendation, Chair. Councillor Davison. Uh, for the recommendation, sir. Councillor Sanger, Andy? Uh, for the officer's recommendation, Chair. Councillor Masters? Abstain, Chair. Can't decide. Yeah. And Councillor Weatherall, Gary, last but not least. For, Chair. Abby, I make that a, that, that recommendation is carried. Yes, thank you very much. So thank you very much for your time um, and your representations. We now move on to the next application, which is item 7B on your agenda. And if I can just find my um, print sheet, it's between pages 51 and 76. And it's application number 21-04854FUL, land ad adjacent to number 8 Southbourne Road, Sheffield. This, I think this is also one of yours, isn't it, um, Chris? So I'll let you take a quick swig and then it's over to you to present the, the report. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, this is the, uh, the second application, the last application on, on, on the list. Um, it is for a site on uh, Southbourne Road, which is within the Broom Hill Conservation Area and within the uh, Be Best Neighbourhood Plan. Um, other notable uh, landmarks, if you like, are the Botanical Gardens to the south on the opposite side of Clark House Road, which has listed buildings within it. Uh, and which front onto Clark House Road. Um, the, the site, the red line, um, is, is as shown on their chair, and that's the extent of the development site under consideration. But it was also uh, originally part of a wider site, which ran through to um, Rutland Park, which is just to the north east of there um, and down onto Clark House Road. It was part of the former uh, Wakesmith um, offices which were converted to residential uh, including a contemporary extension which you can just see to the uh, east of the edge of the red line there uh, fronting um, it's just quite a small rectangular light grey coloured block um, towards uh, Rutland Park. And this red line, um, the, the, sorry, the extent of this application site was also part of that wider site and within it permission was granted for one dwelling, one contemporary dwelling which I'll come on to later. But the important thing to note is the site has permission for a dwelling which because the rest of that scheme has been implemented uh, could be completed tomorrow or commenced tomorrow. Um, so that is a, a very significant material consideration. Uh, this is a view uh, of the site from the botanical gardens. Um, the best way of identifying the site is it, it, it's sort of just behind that tree, uh, the first tree on, on, in from the right, uh, above the uh, no parking sign or clearway sign, or whichever, whichever that is. Um, but the reason I'm showing you that, Chair, is there is a, uh, a historic England comment within the, within the report that refers to proximity to and views from the list of buildings, and this is taken from that kind of area. Um, this is a view of the site looking down Southbourne Road, uh, and it, it's effectively behind, the site is effectively behind the tree. Um, the tree being in the neighbouring garden. Uh, and that is the site. So if you go back, Chair, if I go back one, Chair, you see that the building on the, with the, with the gabled, uh, sort of three-storey gable on the, um, on the left-hand side is immediately to the left now uh, of the site. So the site's former car parking area, I believe it was associated with Wakesmith as part of their day-to-day -day activities as a car parking area. 
Um, you can see there as well uh, the towards the sort of towards the back of the site, the Wakesmith building that was converted, and also the uh, the, the contemporary addition. Uh, this is the footprint of the scheme, which is for three uh, apartments. Uh, there are two three-bedroom apartments, one on the ground floor, one on the first floor, and then uh, on, on the second and third floors is a duplex um, four-bedroom apartment. Uh, and there are far, four car parking spaces within the front garden area, the boundary walls retained and gates are reinstated. Um, this is the, uh, the design of the scheme. So top left is the front elevation, uh, which is stone uh, and, and metal cladding, which mirrors the materials that were used on the contemporary element of the previous scheme on the other side. Uh, and, and that is how it would sit in the, in the street scene. Uh, you can see there, Chair, uh, the, the grey gates uh, reinstated. Um, you can see that the top floor is set in ever so slightly from, um, from the floors below. And in fact, the, the slightly lighter grey right-hand portion, approximately 30% of it, uh, is also pushed back slightly, uh, as you can see better there. Um, this is for sort of benchmark purposes the previous consent so you uh, just quickly flick back the uh, the footprint is is very similar um, to to that which is now proposed um, as is the the arrangement of the front garden area uh, and the the design is is quite similar uh, the main difference of course being it's it's now built up above ground floor level on the right hand side uh, but the height is is very similar to what it was before we might be in the order of about 300 mil or so higher in this case but nothing that we consider significant so again if you just kind of hold that image in your mind it's a shame we can't compare them chair or i couldn't have produced something of that nature uh, but the the comparison is is there. You can see it's slightly larger, but it's, it's of a similar uh, form. Um, and the recommendation is, is approval, Chair. Thank you for that, Chris. I don't have any speakers against this application, but I have one speaker in favour of this application, a Mr Charles Dunn. Mr Dunn, hello. Would you like to come forward to the microphone, make yourself comfortable, and um, Claire will give you hints and tips for the use. So um, when you're ready, the floor is yours for up to five minutes. Thank you, Chair. Um, as we said, I'm representing the applicant for the proposed development and so wish just to summarise the many positives to be gained from the scheme and its contribution to the attractive streetscape in this affluent suburb of the city. As you're aware, the new development, uh, and as Chris has explained, follows a previously consented scheme of a similar design, the consent for which remains live, though this new proposal will now deliver three apartments as opposed to a single dwelling. The benefits of pursuing delivery of an alternative housing type are twofold. First, the subsequent marketing of the plot with permission for a single dwelling has probably surprisingly, not actually yet yielded a purchaser, such that the plot has remained unused and an attractive gap in the street, which this new scheme positively resolves. Second, delivery of three dwellings represents a greater contribution to the city's housing supply, making more efficient use of the land in a very sustainable location where demand for homes is extremely high. Demand for larger parts of apartments such as these is especially high, particularly for those looking to downsize, Delivery of these will therefore not just create three new dwellings, but also allow for corresponding churn in the market, bringing up larger homes down the chain. Accordingly, the proposed development is an excellent addition to the area's attractive building stock, 
offering beautiful homes to those looking to locate in this highly desirable neighbourhood. In further consideration of the development sustainability credentials, the proposals include an appropriate number of off-street parking spaces, which has been confirmed as acceptable by officers in line with the locality's excellent provision of services and facilities, as well as good public transport connections. It should be noted that although the development is described as having a marginal shortfall in parking, the applicant was also actually offered the opportunity by officers to reduce the number of spaces further, though it was felt that four spaces was appropriate given the sensitivities of, of neighbours to this particular issue. Green landscaping is also maximised throughout the site as far as is possible given its size, including areas of green roof and low visual impact grass creek for the aforementioned parking bays. Though marginally larger in some respects as described, the building's footprint is almost identical to that of the previous approval. Indeed, incorporating this footprint on the upper levels achieves more appropriate massing, thus more consistent with neighbouring properties than the single unit, which was very slim and arguably at odds with its surroundings, as confirmed in the officer's report. Accordingly, the apartment block re uh, proposed remains in line with the building heights and widths of the neighbouring properties, sitting comfortably in the street scene and set back from Southbourne Road while the roof level follows the stepping of ridge heights up and down the street. Positive negotiations have also taken place with the case officer and their team leader in the course of the assessment period regarding finer details of the design, particularly the upper floors and elevation as Chris has described. As a result, the roof level is set in from the front and flank elevations, achieving a contemporary interpretation of roof proportions on traditional buildings in the locality and in the, in the conservation area as a whole. Given that location within the conservation area, it is quite correct that any development must be appropriate in the context of the surrounding historic environment. Accordingly, the design of the building reflects the sympathetic contemporary aesthetic that has been delivered nearby on Rutland Park, as was highlighted at the start of the officer's presentation, which sits comfortably among neighbouring dwellings. As with the Rutland Park scheme, the proposed development utilises appropriate materials including ashlar stone and high quality zinc cladding that are widely accepted and incorporated in many different contemporary buildings throughout the conservation area, therefore remaining in keeping with the neighbourhood's established character of varied but complementary buildings. Furthermore, notwithstanding the quality building design, it's reiterated that the proposed building would be some distance from listed structures associated with the botanical gardens as well as being screened by multiple sizable properties along Clark House Road, thereby lacking any intervisibility, and so any tangible impact on the setting of these heritage assets. This lack of impact was also confirmed in the officer's report for the previously approved scheme, the design and scale of which was established as effectively the same as that now proposed. Accordingly, any perceived heritage impact from the proposed development is very minor, and so it's our view that the new building should be supported particularly when considering how it would be more than offset by the numerous wider public benefits to be gained, including the regeneration of a prominent, vacant, previously developed site with a building of exemplary quality, investment in the city and employment for local workers in the construction phase, supporting local services and facilities throughout the lifetime of development, and also helping towards, obviously, a shortfall with respect to Sheffield's housing land supply. With all those benefits in mind, it's respectfully asked that members carry the positive recommendation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Chris, do you have any comments or anything you no, wish to Chair, add? No, nothing to add to that. Okay, thank you. In that case, I will open up to members' questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, Historic England don't seem to be very happy. Um, have they given any ind indication of what kind of building they would like to see in this location? Chris, would you like to come in there? Uh, Chair, Historic England's response was quite interesting uh, because, as the report alludes to, it appeared to slightly conflict with the response on um, the previous application, uh, where they were quite happy with a contemporary approach. And when I've, when I've looked at that in, in, in more detail, I think the only extra thing I can add is that their main focus of concern seemed to be around um, overall scale and finer, finer detailing um, or, or arrangement of uh, fenestration on the property. So in, in terms of scale, they referred 
particularly to the increased height over and above the previously approved dwelling, which, um, sorry, which I have to say, Chair, we disagree with because um, there isn't, that, that's not very helpful, this one. Uh, again, if, I'm sorry if members can kind of hold that image um, in relation to the, it, the, the height of the, the overall height of the roof um, cuts across the kind of the middle of that third story window on the, on the, on the gable to the, to the left hand side. Um, it does something very similar on, on that image. So uh, I don't want to discredit Historic England's comment, Chair, but we just didn't agree with it and we didn't think that would uh, hold water as, a, as an argument. Um, and then secondly, uh, I think that they, they favoured um, the only, the only the difference in scale, as I say, is what I pointed out at the beginning, that the, uh, it's in effect, this scheme is in effect about a third wider. Um, but, uh, again, our view was that the proportions, overall proportions of that were more suited to and better reflected those of other traditional properties within the conservation area than, than that one does. Um, I think, if anything, that one, yeah, if you look at that, that's broadly the same width as, as, the, as purely the gable element of the neighbouring property to the, uh, to the left. So we felt that it was unreasonable to pursue significant alterations to the scheme on, on the back of those comments um, in, in the light of that. But uh, as I said at the beginning, we did, we did feel that it could be improved, sorry, not that one, uh, it could be improved slightly by uh, just setting back the um, the right hand portion of the upper floor, and the the reason for that was to align it better and to distinguish it um, with the change in materials on the on the front portion, uh, on the lower portion. Sorry, she got the staircase on the on the right hand side, and we felt it would be a sensible thing to do to reflect that change. Um, so I, I can't speak for Historic England Chair, but uh, they were broadly supportive of the of a contemporary approach, but didn't, just didn't like this one. Um, I think is the simplest way of putting it. Fair enough. Is oh, sorry, Chair. Sorry, Chair. And I would just say the other point we on this particular portion of the site we felt was not supportable in terms of their comment was. Uh, the relationship to the listed buildings on Clark House Road because it, it's quite some distance away uh, and uh, you know, it, it can't really be seen in any views to or from those listed buildings and that view I think applied more sensibly to the site as a whole uh, and in particular the Rutland Park um, portion um, which we between us declared was acceptable previously so it was slightly confusing. Thank you for that, Chris. I've got two indications. I've got Councillor Armshaw, Brian first, then I've got your, your indication. Yep. <clears throat> um, I wonder why there's, there's no view looking up the road. Uh, because given that I, I do know this road, uh, without looking up the road, you don't realise that every property on this road is a traditional Victorian villa. Um, they are not bland and blocky like this one. The, the, the image that you, you shot up on the screen of the side wall of this building was so boring. Uh, if you look at number 31, I think it's possibly this, this one here. Yeah, 28, yeah. So I'm not surprised that uh, English Heritage uh, are not impressed by it. Um, could, you, could you possibly have gone back to English Heritage and found out more detail um, if you weren't sure what they were after? Chris, would you like to comment? Uh, Chair, there are a couple of questions there. I think the first one is why is the new no view up the road? Uh, I can't be honest, Chair, that, that they were the images that were, were provided um, by the officer from, from their site visit. Uh, yes, I would confirm that other properties up the street, particularly on the right hand side, uh, are, um, are of a traditional form that you saw on the left hand side of the images that were shown. Um, 
the, the response from Historic England was uh, three or four pages long. Uh, the, this summary here is very, is very short. There was enough detail in there to understand what they were saying. Um, but uh, as I mentioned in response to the last question, Chair, we didn't agree with, uh, with, with their, their observations. Okay, thank you for that. I'll move on to a question from Councillor Sanga. Andy? Uh, th 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 thank you, Chair. Um, and I think it's really to, to, uh, to un understand the response in terms of the um, agreed neighbourhood plan, so in terms of BBES policy SBC3. So you talk about on page 64 that um, you, know, you, 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 I think you're saying in, in, in that that um, this meets um, what that policy is trying to do. And then it goes on on the next page talking about DDHM1, key design principles, um, which I guess is, is the more challenging one. I guess it relates back to what Councillor Holmshaw and Councillor Chaplin were, 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 at, were asking about. Uh, I, I mean, I mean is, it, is it DDHM1, key design principles, that is referred to in terms of the representations of people saying that this scheme, that this scheme doesn't fit in with BBES policy? It's contrary to BB. I mean, is it the design principles on page 65, which which we're referring to? Is that the challenge in this in this application? I, I, I believe I, I believe so, Chair. I believe that the representations that suggest there's a failure to comply with the best policy are relating to uh, general design considerations more than the. Uh, SBC3 efficient use of land um, requirement. I think that was the question. So, 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 just, so just to clarify, so we've talked a, a bit in your presentation about the about the boundary wall on the the, 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 the gate. Um, so are we down to whether this re respects established building lines? Is that it? Because my reading of DDHM1 is it doesn't it doesn't refer to how, how we how we build in, in this particular site. It just says, it, it, it just has, has these four points, but it doesn't talk specifically about what the design should be. Uh, Chair, I haven't got a policy in front of me. Um, and I can't see it in the report either. Uh, Chair? Um, I think the four points that Councillor Sangar is referring to on page 65. Thank you. Yeah, it's been pointed out. Yeah, sorry. Couldn't see it for looking. Um, yes, any suggestion that it doesn't comply would be, would be uh, a failure to comply with those elements, I think. I'm pretty sure it was about those rather than the, uh, the, the density arrangements. And some of those requirements aren't particularly relevant to, to this scheme. For example, D, delivering public realm enhancements is, is something you would expect on a, on a much larger scheme than this. Um, in, in terms of A, it, it reflects the elements of A that it can, i.e. it retains the wall, it restores a, a, a gate. Um, there is some additional planting. It's currently a tarmac surface behind a wall chair. Uh, and, and it does respect uh, established building lines, so, so we feel that it, it, it meets those, uh, those aims. Uh, thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I've also got Councillor Woodpark. Claire? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, yeah, I'm just a little bit concerned about the parking situation. Is, um, can, can you um, let me know what the on-street parking situation is around there, and if it's he a heavily parked up area? I'm just concerned about the adequacy of it. Thank you. Um, I don't know. I think Mark, probably this is more appropriate yeah, for Chair, you. Um, I, mean, I didn't personally deal with this planning application, but I, I did have a, a site visit before committee today. And um, whilst I've not observed on-street parking after the hours of work, it was a normal working day when I undertook my site visit, I did notice that the other <clears throat> properties that front the road have significant drives a significant amount of off-street car parking provision. So I, 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 don't, I, don't, I didn't feel that any, any on-street parking from this, if it did occur, was necessarily going to uh, 
to upset neighbours um, in the way that applications sometimes in crooks, whereas terraced housing with no streetcar parking provision can, can, can generate significant friction sometimes between neighbours. I, I just didn't get that feel from the site visit that I undertook. Is that satisfactory? Yes, yes that's okay. fine. Thank you, Chair. Right. Um, Brian, I'll let you have another go at the cherry. Um. One more question. Thank you. Uh, so I'm interested in policy BE5, which is on page 65, towards the top. Uh, original architecture will be encouraged that, that new buildings should complement the scale, form, and keyly, architectural style of surrounding buildings. So given that, and that's a key city policy, uh, should this not have been taken back to the developer? Chris, uh, would you like to comment? Chair, I'm just looking for the policy as we're talking. Um, yeah, I, policy B5 is uh, is now, I can't do the maths, uh, quite a long, it uh, dates from 1998. Uh, it is still relevant, um, and, and we do consider it has very useful uh, elements to it. Uh, we feel it does complement the scale and, and overall uh, form where it differs slightly is in its architectural treatment where it differs considerably is it architectural treatment because it's it's clearly a very contemporary form um, and within conservation areas and often many streets we feel that a good quality contemporary scheme is a better approach than uh, than a not so good quality pastiche which is often sometimes what what can happen um, we felt that in this particular case, there is a relationship to the existing development which has taken place um, that fronts Rutland Park, which we feel is, is successful. Um, and and it, it's almost in a, uh, a mirror of that. It's a similar distance up from, from Clark House Road. And as one infill unit, uh, we feel this actually um, improves the uh, appearance of the conservation area at that point because the site at the moment uh, is, is a negative has a negative effect upon it um, it's, it's a vacant open gap in the in the street scene um, and we feel this is an appropriate um, plugging of that gap with something that's of, of, of satisfactory quality thank you for that Chris um, I'll move on to members' comments now. Councillor Davison, I've got Councillor Sango and then Councillor Masters. Uh, thank you for this. I mean, this is a conservation area. I don't mind the design. I just think it's in the wrong place. I don't, uh, and I, I, I think it's a good idea to, to build on that site the kind of accommodation that is being built. I, what has swayed me in favour, because it is actually on the edge of the conservation area, uh, was that uh, uh, Chris pointed out that it was of a, a high standard and it was better to have that high standard rather than something that fitted in but that wasn't such a high standard. So on those grounds, I will be supporting it. But I just hope that in the future, people won't look at it and say, who the hell passed that? Thank you. Thank you for Councillor Davidson. I've got Councillor Masters. Barbara? Thank you, Chair. Um, I actually did go to look at the property on Rutland Road because I was concerned about the appearance. And I was quite reassured by what I saw. But I didn't think it looked quite as stark in reality as it does on the pictures on the screen. So, yeah, contemporary... It's, uh, some people like it, some people don't, but I'm, I support the scheme. Thank you. Councillor um, Sanger, Andy. Uh, th thanks, Chair. I mean, I shall be supporting the officer's recommendation. I, I, I think this is a, 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 a quality design, and I think it's better than what we approved back in 2017, and that to me is the base point. It's clearly a piece of land that can be developed. Um, we come back to this issue about conservation areas and what to do in terms of building it and it, it, it's clearly 
challenging. I mean, the planning officers are not going to turn me into into a, a, a modernist, but equally, equally, we can't have pastiches of late Victorian Gothic revival revivalism just for the just as, as you say, because it, it, that will end up looking just as bad. Um, this is quality material. It, it's, it's, it's a good design, it's contemporary design. We've got lots of instances in other places in Broomhill where we've gone for those sort of things. As long as we keep the, the, the quality in terms of the, 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 the building, the, you know, the, 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 the facades and the materials used, um, I think it's a, a good design. I think it's appropriate for this, this site, and I should be supporting it. I, I'm just disappointed that we can't get historic England to understand what we have to do with this this wider area and, and, and adopt a more uh, a more measured approach to making sure that we get quality new builds uh, on, on, on vacant sites in, in this conservation area. Uh, that, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Pete, Councillor Pye. Thank you, Councillor Sangor. I've stolen my words, really, because uh, if we approve the previous uh, application with, with support of historic England, etc., I think this is better. It looks better, it's quality, and I think it improves the area. And although it's, people say it's out of character, I think it gives it an additional attraction, actually. If it's a quality building in the right place, it, you can sustain a number of, small number of this type of modern development. So I fully support it, Chair, and com compliment the development. Thank you, Pete. I've got Councillor Mike Chapin. Mike. Thank you, Chair. And I, too, am indebted to uh, Councillor Sanger for his comments. So that the only additional thing I want to say is that... I, had this been placed on Clark House Road opposite Botanical Gardens, I, I could well understand um, concerns being raised and I would probably be voting the other way, but I, I welcome this uh, quality building at this location and it'll be good to see the back of the tarmac. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> thank you very much. Councillor Humshaw, Brian. Um, thank you for that. Um, thank you everyone else for the comments. Um, However, I feel that uh, English Heritage is spot on in identifying the problem here. It's, it's, it, re it really is the wrong, play, wrong thing in the wrong place, as are the Sheffield Conservation Advisory Group and Be Best uh, and other residents who have noted that this is a uh, bland and blocky contemporary building in a Victorian conservation area, and that should count for something. So I shall not be voting for this uh, officer's recommendation. Thank you. And last say this time goes to Councillor Basharat. There you go. Okay. Um, myself and uh, similar. I, um, um, I like the building. Uh, I've been on this road quite a few times and I think this is quite nice. Uh, the only concern I had uh, was the number eight uh, South Bourne Road um, overlooking and uh, overshadowed. But I think reading further is uh, some of the explanation given it satisfies me. So um, I fully support this as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, I shall go around the room now um, and ask for, um, go to the vote. The officer reason, uh, the officer uh, recommendations to grant conditionally. So I'm asking for your views on whether you support that recommendation for the reasons as set out in the report. Councillor Humshaw. Uh, yeah, I do not support this recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Chaplin. For the recommendation, Chair. Councillor Price. For the recommendation, Chair. Councillor Downs. For the recommendation, Chair. Councillor Basharat. For the recommendation. Thank you. Um, Councillor Woodcroft. For the recommendation, Chair. Councillor McCann. For the recommendation, Chair. Councillor Davidson. Uh, for the recommendation, Chair. Uh, Councillor Masters. For the recommendation, Chair. And Councillor Sanger. For the officer's recommendation, Chair. Thank you very much. I think that's overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly carried, Abby. Yes? Yep. So thank you very much. The final item on the agenda today is, the, is to note the record of planning appeals, submissions and decisions. And I'm noting here that there are only three um, appeals decisions that have been dismissed and they were all delegated decisions. So I don't think we've got any learning to take from those. 
and the date of the next meeting of this committee will be Tuesday the 9th of August at 2 p.m. So thank you all very much for your attendance and I'll see you next month. Thank you.